And hello. Hi, it's Kathy Frey here from IMCO, from the International Integrated Maternity Healthcare Organization. And welcome along to this week's Maternity Natural Health webinar. And wrapped to have today, Dr. Sarah Connors. So Sarah, say hello. Hello, everyone. Good to be here today. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, Sarah is um, an Indigenous naturopathic doctor and birth doula. So uh, we're, I'm going to be fascinated here about that. Um, and she practices um, in Kitchener, Waterloo um, and Simcoe, Muskoka. I uh, hope I've said that right. Um, in Ontario, in Canada. And um, at in the Saratoga Family Naturopathic, um, which roughly translates to healing waters of great of the Great Spirit. So that's her practice. Um, it was created in order to help women and their families live their healthiest lives um, and improve the health of women um, before and during pregnancy. And we can start to affect, you know, the next generation's health in a positive ways, boy. And, you know, the more that we'll, I'm sure we'll be covering this today, um, but, you know, the more that we study uh, about preconception care and, and pregnancy health and stuff, the more that we are realizing, science is realizing that it impacts that next generation. I mean, it just does. Um, and the more that we're learning, the more we're right, realizing, oh my God, we didn't realize that. <laughs> um, so areas of uh, Dr. Connor's focus includes generational family health, which we're obviously going to be talking about today, um, and pediatrics, women's health, indigenous health, mind, body, medicine, general health and well-being. Um, and so that topic today is really focusing on generational family health and understanding prenatal well-being from the seven generational approach, which I'm sure most of us here are particularly interested to be hearing about. So what we're going to do is the format with today is um, I'm going to hand over to Sarah and she's got a PowerPoint presentation that she's going to go through, which will take about half an hour or thereabouts. Um, don't hesitate to put any questions up. Just there's at the bottom of the, there's a button at the bottom of your screen. Usually that should say Q&As. So type any questions in there that you've got for Sarah. Um, and also there's a little place in there called chat. And uh, we always like to know where people are from. So if you feel like putting your, um, your, your role and um, your location in there, that'd be fascinating to read. And so welcome to Sarah. I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And uh, hello, everyone. I like to say Sego as well, which is uh, Mohawk for hello. Um, and nice to see some people responding. So nice to have you. Um, and the reason the reason I explain that is, as Kathy mentioned, I, I am born, raised in Canada. And uh, Mo Mohawk is one part of my heritage, but then I also have quite a bit of European heritage as well. So hence the curly hair and, and not looking particularly indigenous for anyone who is watching the webinar. <laughs> I do get that question quite a bit. Um, I also have Irish and, and various, uh, like I said, Western European. But the reason I mention that, and it'll be clearer as we get into the material, is that I do not say that I am speaking for every single indigenous person in Canada, let alone across the world. This is more of my understanding in terms of how I was raised, what I was taught, and how that factors into the concept of the seven generational model. Most indigenous, definitely in Canada, North America, and, and quite arguably most of um, the globe as well, have some concept of this. Um, but you can see how it could potentially be expanded upon and, and would definitely apply in some way, shape, or form with most of the Indigenous communities that we have an opportunity to work with. And as Kathy mentioned, I work quite a bit with my local Indigenous. So look, when I say local Indigenous for me, I'm referring to uh, Southern Ontario, a little bit of Northern Ontario. That's the majority of my experience. So I just like to kind of preface that ahead of time in case there is someone who's like, that's not my experience. <laughs> I can't I, possibly yeah. speak to every single Indigenous experience. Yeah. But Preface it, that this is your journey. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And for anyone who I believe pays attention to the news, um, you know a lot of the uh, residential schools and what's been going on in Canada in the last several months 
in terms of finding uh, the children that were buried near the residential schools and on site. And so in terms of Canadian news, the Indigenous health and awareness around Indigenous health has really grown and, and, and expanded in a very big way in the last uh, several months, mostly for the good, but, and that's kind of what we're talking about here is how can we really start to bring more of those approaches to the forefront and start to change or, or modify the way that we do things so that we are being more attentive, aware, and compassionate and caring towards our um, Indigenous clients and, and patients and, and whoever we may have the opportunity to work with um, in our offices, in our programs, that kind of thing. So that's kind of where um, I yeah, built. Yeah, and also taking, taking from their wisdom as well, isn't it? You mm -hmm. know, not coming in with the, the idea that, oh, you know, Western medicine knows it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so, so I'll hand you over. Yeah, so I will start to share the screen here. And like I said, I will do my best to keep us well on time. There we go. And I will do my best to keep an eye on the, um, the Q&A in the chat as well. Um, but uh, if, if I happen to not quite see it, <laughs> maybe Kathy can, can wave me down. Um, or also, if you want to wait until we've kind of covered the content uh, for today, then that would be that would be fine as well. So yeah, no problem. Of, I'll monitor those. All yeah. good. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I like to start here just as our base, so that we have a common ground in terms of where we're starting from. So when I say the concept of the seven generations, and I, as I mentioned, this can vary from nation to nation. But generally speaking, most of us have some sort of concept of when a decision is made, we consider the seven generations that came before us and the seven generations that will come after us. So we look at that from the perspective of when we're making decisions, we are looking at the wisdom of those who came before us and, and we perhaps even learning from the ways that things were done before and improving upon them. And then also considering what is the impact of this decision going to have on our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, et cetera. So it's where a lot of our basis for um, stewardship of, of nature and of the world comes from. Um, we're thinking about leaving our, our world, our resources, everything that we have that's been cared for for us, how can we also leave that for the generations to come is where we're coming from with that. And so then what we can also start to understand in terms of where things currently sit for many of us, especially when we're, we have our, our mothers, our expectant mothers, our mothers to be, in our offices, in, in working with them, we also understand, especially for majority of Indigenous, and like I said, I'm predominantly speaking to what I know from a Canadian context, is that we have a large impact of generational trauma. So it's that cycle of trauma where we've been exposed to traumas in previous generations, and they were the ones that actually experienced that traumatic event. So the big one that we talk about is colonization it was kind of the big impact that first happened. And then the myriads of traumas and things that happened after that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. And so for those of us who are more familiar with this concept of intergenerational trauma, we know that these things can manifest as emotional distress, avoidance, overly negative thinking, engaging in risky behavior, trouble sleeping, and so many other poor health outcomes, mental, physical, emotional. And what we end up seeing is that these effects aren't just affecting those who initially experienced the trauma, it's, ex it's also showing in their children and their descendants as signs of trauma. And so we're seeing these long-term distress within our indigenous communities from some of these original traumas. So the other piece that we know plays a big role in that is the role of epigenetics. 
And I'm not going to go into all the details and in-depth pieces of epigenetics, but just to highlight how the physiological transmission of that trauma is happening, because we know from the research that behaviors and environments impact the gene expression and the DNA expression, and that's revealing to us how the impact of the trauma is then passed down through the genes for as many as potentially 14 generations. We're still in figuring this out in terms of the research, in terms of how far the range is, but that seems to be some of the consensus. And we know from that, then those changes are then replicated and further passed down to those generations. And essentially it becomes a form of inherited post-traumatic stress disorder. And just kind of highlighting that again, those um, some of those early studies where um, mice were given ample food and they you know went about their day, all that kind of thing. The food was then reduced to a minimum amount so that the mice then became aggressive and anxious. And the food supply was reinstated to the mice, but the aggressive behavior didn't actually change. And then they bred those mice and we had a new generation of mice and those new mice that were never actually cut off from food, they weren't um, restricted in their, their food from the time they were born, still showed those aggressive uh, tendencies of their parents in terms of their conditioning, even though they never actually experienced the initial trauma of having food reductions and having uh, an environment that was aggressive and anxious but they still showed these traits. So this is where some of that just shows that impact of generational trauma and, and the epigenetic link between the two. And we know when we're talking about the fetal DNA, so the DNA of that new life and the lives that are to come, in terms of the, that initial impact, the egg itself, the egg that formed us, was inside our mother while she was a fetus. And then that was inside of our grandmother's womb, right? So that's, so we start to see how from a Western scientific research model, as well as our indigenous understanding and, and knowledge model, these things are all connected. They're all connected in the sense that we have this, both ways of understanding now that this is where some of these impacts have come from. And so when we see um, a mother, an expectant mother, um, someone in our office who's ex had experiences of, um, say, you know, addiction or alcohol abuse or, um, you know, difficulties in terms of their health um, for various reasons, um, I don't want to pick on all the, the stereotypes that are typically given to um, our Indigenous communities, but the reason I mention them is because they are, they are issues in a lot of our communities. they are ongoing issues in a lot of our communities, and most of those things are actually coping mechanisms that many individuals have developed in order to try and deal with generational trauma that they don't fully understand themselves and is impacting them in terms of their ability to cope and to be a healthy um, soon to be mother, a healthy mother and a healthy parent. So it's the, the prenatal, if we're, if we're really thinking of it in that kind of bigger context is technically traveling back seven generations or more, right? In terms of the impact. And the point is not to be all doom and gloom and we'll get to some of the positives in a few minutes, but it's just to highlight because we still do have a lot of stigma around, um, you know, for, for lack of a better term, and I, I don't typically use this term lightly, is the stereotypical Indian. So if you ask the average person who's in, unfamiliar with Indigenous people, unfamiliar with Indigenous issues, um, they, they would probably name off some of those stereotypes of, um, you know, being, being a drunk, being, an, an addict being, you know, fill in the blank here. And if we can start to understand it from a compassionate place of um, more of a, a wounded child that doesn't really fully understand what's happened to them 
and how they can possibly start to heal, then I think it becomes a different conversation and we can be more compassionate and understanding healthcare providers to our patients. So this is by no means the complete list of effects of colonization on Indigenous individuals, but it's just to give you kind of some of the highlights so that we can start to understand how wide ranging of an impact. And really it was various levels of trauma and arguably individual traumas that each of these things had just from the start of colonization. So we had loss of identity through loss of language and traditional knowledge. We had the long-term effects, have the long-term effects of residential schools. Um, other places I know um, in the world, they may have had like boarding schools and things like that, where it may not be, have been the residential school program that we have here in, in Canada, but um, very, very similar, right? Then we also have the poor living conditions on reserves. There's many reserves that either have minimal or no clean, dependable clean running water. Um, that's still an ongoing issue for a number of reserves in Canada. 60s scoop, um, again, can't get into the full depth of this, but basically for anyone who's not familiar with what the 60s scoop is, it was a period of time, the 60s, when a very, 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 very large component of children were taken out of their homes and placed with non-Indigenous families for various reasons. For some of them, you know, their home was untenable um, and they did need uh, child services and things like that to step in. But what ended up happening at that time is we had a large number of children that didn't end up getting placed with Indigenous families or um, Indigenous uh, family members who potentially could help to provide care. And so they ended up in non-Indigenous homes and many of them never or weren't until they were adults found out that, especially if they were quite young, one, that they were Indigenous, and two, what their Indigenous heritage was. So again, that loops back into loss of identity and culture. And then, of course, the ongoing issues with murdered and missing Indigenous women. Um, the, we're, we still don't know the full uh, concept and the full numbers of what we're actually looking at with murdered and missing Indigenous women in Canada. And the the thought is that we still won't know for quite some time, but again, that's members of our family are being lost. Um, and it's, it's just perpetuating that underlying effect of loss of culture, loss of identity. So then how do we really start to even begin to heal from something that has been, not only was it that original trauma, but it's technically been ongoing trauma since the original trauma. So there's the generational trauma and then also the potential for individual trauma as well, because we know um, that a parent who didn't have the opportunity to be parented well themselves isn't going to be an effective, isn't going to have the opportunity to be an effective parent in terms of going to that next generation. And so we can start to see how these things just get passed on from one to the next, right? So this is this legacy that we're dealing with in terms of how it's impacted our, our people and how it's impacted our, our health as, as individuals and then as a collective as well. And so in order to be able to heal that, we need to be looking at models of holistic and true holistic services and programs. And what we're really seeing and understanding um, in programs that are focusing on getting our, our communities and individuals back onto the land, being integrated with nature, having access to elders, um, and, and these various ceremonial services and things like that, um, we're really starting to understand for that, especially for the Indigenous, I would argue for others as well, but especially for, for our communities, that sickness does begin with the spirit. And if the spirit is wounded because of the principle of interconnectedness, the mind and the emotions and the body become sick. So it's not just one area that's affected. 
So like I said, there are multitudes of teachings. I couldn't possibly cover every single nation, individual, all those kinds of things in the you know short amount of time that we have together today. But like I said, this is a fairly well-known uh, teaching that influences most of our Indigenous um, in one way or another. And this is also what I am most familiar with and what I've grown up with. And so um, one of the biggest direct influences, which we kind of touched on a little bit, is that concept of the seven generations and how we integrate that. And one of the main teachings that is also tied to um, the seven generations teaching is the concept of the medicine wheel. And the medicine wheel is used in a lot of our teachings in either part or in full. But if you've ever seen a dream catcher, that is one facet of, um, of the medicine wheel because um, with that idea, or even if you've seen um, in most of our representations, it'll have the four different colors and that four different colors can mean many different things. It can mean the four um, color peoples of the world. It can mean uh, the four aspects of, of a person, like what we're talking about here. Um, a healthy state is that physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, all four pieces combining into one that are interconnected and always connecting and influencing the other. And that's what um, that medicine meal can mean and does mean in many different ways. Um, like I said, there's, there's entire, <laughs> um, some of the elders in our communities, they, they teach for, for hours on the medicine wheel. So we can't possibly go completely in depth with that today. But just to give us a tangible um, concept to work with that's been a very successful implementation of the use of traditional knowledge and incorporating all the different pieces into our, our communities and understanding how that can have a positive impact on our whole health. So when I say that, I'm referring to the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And if anyone is a naturopath or, or if you're somewhat familiar with naturopathic concepts, that is one of the main tenets of naturopathic medicine is that we treat the whole person. It's not just treating one piece. We want to get to the root cause of illness. We're not just treating symptoms and putting a Band-Aid on it, right? And this is part of how I've come to know this and, and really integrated the two naturopathic teachings with our Indigenous teachings and incorporating that into my work. Um, and so with, with this um, particular example we have here, um, we have the it's it's an impact and, and potential way of looking at um the medicine teaching and how it can have a direct impact so the for anyone who's not familiar there's the north american indigenous games which is a sport competition that we've had in canada um and and partly in america as well um for indigenous people since about the 1990s and it's held every three years and when they actually studied uh, the impact of the North American Indigenous Games, what they found was that the, the individuals had the opportunity to participate in the games actually showed or reported an increase in their pride as Indigenous people. And that helped them to understand more about their own culture and other Indigenous cultures as an important factor in healing the identity of Indigenous people. So what did that actually end up meaning from a research standpoint? So when they did um, an impact survey, this is some of the findings that they ended up coming up with. So there was approximately 56% of respondents who did not smoke cigarettes or drugs at that time. There was approximately 40% who did not drink alcohol. Of those who did smoke or do drugs or drink, 84% strongly agreed or agreed that participating in the games helped them cut down or quit doing drugs. 78% strongly agreed or agreed that participating in the games helped them cut down or quit smoking. 
and 73% strongly agreed or agreed that participating in the games helped them cut down or quit drinking alcohol. So those are some pretty big impacts that we can see from a cultural based program that was implemented with, um, with, with, the, with our health. There were direct impacts on individuals either making positive health behavioral changes or uh, starting to make positive health changes. So that's a direct correlation there um, or direct link anyway, that is very interesting. And this is something we see in a lot of programming that has been implemented with some aspect of culture and identity integrated into the, into the program. And it really does sh show and highlight how important our cultural identity is in terms of our, our healing process and recognizing that it's one of the things that was really significantly impacted by colonization. And unfortunately is still at the point where it is affected quite largely in, in terms of how things are currently still happening today. We tend to think of colonization as something that happened in the past, but technically the last residential school in Canada didn't close until 1996. Um, we still have a very large proportion of Indigenous children making up the percentages of children who are in the foster care system, in the child care system, um, and, and not all of them have the opportunity to work with an Indigenous-based child um, health uh, association. That's the other thing too. So there's still a lot to be done there, um, and we can start to see how Ill health isn't quite as simple as just, um, you know, getting someone into a, a quit smoking program or um, something like that that can have a really big impact on the mother's health and on the infant's health or the growing uh, infant's health. It's also um, more, it, it's just, it's bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. And understanding that cultural identity is an especially important component of ill health in the case of where there was generational trauma and traumas, but also then in starting to build that up and build that back and starting to integrate things where we have access to cultural identity and the opportunity to build cultural identity is a big deal. And so then it becomes more than just a Band-Aid solution because we're actually looking at the root cause or one of the root causes in terms of identity disruption and, and disconnection from identity and culture. And so that's where we can really start to, to heal and, and understand that the spirit needs to be healed um, and that we need to look at incorporating things like, um, like the games, like um, Cam H in Toronto, uh, it's the Center for Addictions and Mental Health. They have quite a few uh, programs available where people actually get a chance to connect with elders. They get a chance to participate in smudge, in, um, in sweat lodge, and a lot of our traditional ceremonies. And that has continuously been shown again and again to be important and to be helping in terms of um, rehabilitation and, and recovery, right? And so that's, that's where we really need to be encouraging and supporting and looking at how we can do that from whatever context um, we're in. Because I know we were a wide range of healthcare professionals um, in, this, in this community where um, you know, we don't all work directly with indigenous perhaps, but um, the other thing too, is there's still a lot of fear in terms of someone who is Indigenous and identifies in, as an Indigenous individual sharing that part of their identity with their healthcare provider. So if we can do things to show and, and to further create that trust um, where they can trust us, where we can show that we are, are allies and supportive of these various things, then that's where we can really start to be good Profession, healthcare professional allies to our patients and start to really provide culturally 
sensitive care to our patients um, because we're supportive of these things that can increase and instill pride um, in terms of our self-identity and learning about our individual cultures, which are not all the same, and that how that can then translate to healthy behaviors for that individual, for that mother, for that woman who could or will become a mother, um, and in terms of her impact on her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, and really tying into that concept and understanding of the next seven generations and how they are impacted. And we're seeing that through the research that is being done that when we're actually supporting those initiatives to build self-esteem and um, start to break down those walls of feeling undeserving and feeling not enough and recognizing that that is just as much of an important part of that individual's overall health as is any herb, nutritional supplement, dietary intervention, um, medication, you know, fill in the blank here, that we can potentially provide as well. It's understanding that all of these pieces fit together and really need to be addressed as a whole, um, as a collective. And then that can actually make a much bigger, much longer lasting impact for the positive when we start to think of it from that, from that perspective. So um, that's, that's really what we're talking about here. So like I said, we're talking about the medicine wheel and that seven generations and how the two tie together. And that that really does need to be that, in, that important cornerstone um, that we're, we're supporting and, and nurturing just as much as any of the other things because the other things will only have so much of an impact if the opportunity for changing underlying behavior also is able to be supported. And that's where specific cultural and spiritual practices that are, are important to that individual, to their, to their nation, to their heritage, that's where this can really have a, an impact. So we're, we're doing everything we can to restore um, Indigenous identity and, and to build that strength and that cultural pride is really what we're talking about. And moving beyond just how we tend to think of things from a Western health recovery model and starting to um, integrate some of those um, Indigenous tr traditions and knowledge and how that can really impact the next seven generations. So that was the material that I had prepared for in terms of the, uh, the presentation today. So I'll just um, put up my, uh, my information there. Um, if anyone does uh, wish to connect with me, um, that's all the information there. And I'll turn it back over to, to Kathy. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, yeah, we'll leave that screen up for a little bit so people can mm. make a note of it. Um, and then also those that um, registered for the webinar for today, whether they came in live or they're watching it later, um, will also receive um, an automated message from Zoom um, with your contact details um, in 24 hours from now. So, so that's great. So fascinating, isn't it? You know, um, uh, I mean, a lot of people uh, on here know that I happen to be in New Zealand. So of course, our indigenous people are the Maori. Um, and, you know, it, the colonization effects are, this, are this, you know, similar all over the world. And, um, you know, it, it's uh, they, that, um, uh, research that you talked about with the behavior of the mice, goodness me, that was quite fascinating. Um, you know, that, that, that it had already changed the genetics, that it already impacted the next generation. And that's mm -hmm. only mice, you know, we're far more complicated beings, aren't we? Um, so what about um, putting that into more into the maternity um, journey um, what do you think are the things that um, our maternity health professionals aren't 
maybe you know what are the things that they're doing that you think they're doing really quite well um, and what are the things that we are notoriously doing really poorly for our indigenous people yeah so I, I think I think that there's some like you said there's definitely some positives and some some not great <laughs> ways that we're approaching things um, like I said in terms of my local what I see we have um, we have different health centers and healthcare teams and things like that in, in Canada and Ontario, which um, that's part of what I work with. So um, there's friendship right. centers. Yeah. So um, the various um, doctors, nurses, health, health um, counselors, um, you know, all the different health professionals that are working together as a collective team. Um, there's actually a, um, there, it's not the only one, it's just the one I work with. Um, mm -hmm. There's one in Ontario called the Chickamauk um, Community Health Center. And Chickamauk's mandate is to provide uh, culturally appropriate care to our Indigenous communities. So there's lots of, so you have access to a staff of healthcare providers who are much more understanding of Indigenous culture, Indigenous traditions, Indigenous knowledge. It's only one example. There's um, quite a few where, where it's becoming much more of that collaborative understanding model where um, the individual has access to, say, an elder first. Mm -hmm. And then after they have their intake with the elder, then it's once they've had that, then they'll go on to work with the family doctor, the nurse practitioner, the um, foot specialist, um, you know, whatever kinds of services are within that particular health center. So I think some of these integrative models that are being developed, um, Mama Way is another one that's in Barry, um, Barry, Ontario, that I also do some work with. Um, so there it's, it's much that that concept of really bringing in the cultural piece is happening in a much wider context than it right. has in the past. Um, having um, Indigenous midwives and having access to Indigenous midwives is another thing we're starting to see more and more of that as well. And being able to provide more culturally appropriate birth care and pregnancy care and prenatal care. Um, so actually supporting the mother to be integrated into her cultural identity and cultural traditions. And having Do you that find impact. that um, any of the um culturally traditional birth practices um, are sometimes just like really in conflict with you know the the obstetric westernized system or do you find that most of the time it can be working complementary i think there's always the opportunity to be complementary and to work together as an, as a team um, I think a lot of it has to come down to the mindset and the openness of each individual practitioner at that point. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it doesn't have to be um, conflicting, um, but it depends on the person's perspective and openness to being working as a collaborative team. And I don't think it has to be this antagonistic us versus them um model but it that is dependent on the person being open and understanding and willing to have that conversation and to understand that you know we can we can all work together collaboratively yes yes it's not that hard <laughs> <laughs> but it, I, I love how you said it so subtly it just depends on people's open-mindedness <laughs> yes you know and um i certainly would have but I've seen over, you know, the last decade or two, because we've that as we've got a younger generation of obstetricians coming in, you know, we now have millennials who are obstetricians. Um, and, uh, you know, because the millennials are now, you know, some of them are actually hit 40. And um, there does seem to be... Um, a, a little bit more of this open-mindedness and a little bit more flexibility than, and I know that I'm stereotyping here because it doesn't apply to all obstetricians, um, 
but you know that we, we have had I think sometimes in the past especially say for, you know 15 years ago or something um, where you know some of our um, our, our misters our big bosses you know on birthing suite sort of thing might have you know their way that they want things done because um, they're God and um, that sort of has started to wane a lot and it, there's um, more of a collaboration expected as part of good care. Um, so are you seeing that there as well as we just sort of progress along with having some younger staff come through? I, I think overall that is starting to be more of the, like you said, with the younger doctors, more of them are, are becoming aware, um, have been made aware that sort of thing and, and they grew up aware often didn't yes. they you know yeah. that's the point it's their whole life they've had uh you know they, they were born in 1980 or 1990 and they've grown up really mm -hmm. feel it, you know with respect of culture yeah so it's become ingrained oh we've changed their dna <laughs> Oh, did it change? Oops. <laughs> oh, I said we, we must have changed their DNA with their behavior. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sorry, like I thought you had the screen, screen shift and I was like, oh, did I hit something? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So we are going to be winding up soon, but just wondering if, uh, if anybody does have any questions. Um, that we haven't covered off for Sarah, do just type them in now. Um, the epigenetics, where you're talking about the 14 generations being the seven generations before that person and the seven generations after that person, I think that is just, it's just beyond fascinating, you know, and it's, and that's the thing with epigenetics is that the more we study, the more we realize we don't understand um, and the more there is to study. Um, I was actually a research midwife for myself myself for a while at Auckland University and and although it wasn't epigenetics we were studying but it became pretty pretty obvious that it, it really it really brought it home to me as a research midwife of the fact that the more we study the more we realize we don't understand mm -hmm. and the more that prompts another study you know because you, you have these results and you're like wow, that's not what we expected. We need to study more about that, you know, and then we go into, you know, fine tune in that direction or whatnot. And um, I think there's such um, an, an expectation that the, medic, the medicine knows everything now and it doesn't. It's, it's, no. it's the more it studies, it realizes it, 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 there's so much it doesn't know. You know, we don't need, I'll say that to sometimes women, you know, we, we don't even know how to stop hiccups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right? We've Drink never worked out how to cure hiccups. So there's a lot we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that is wonderful. And um, oh, somebody was just saying here, Geraldine, just want to thank you both. I learned a lot and really did know a lot about the subject matter. And really did not know a lot about the subject matter. Well, that's fascinating. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Is there anything else that you would like to um, add before we close today? Um, I think the, the one thing I, and I often um, say this when I have opportunities like this, is just, um, you know, really ask yourself and, and check in with your own perceptions and, and thoughts around what your understanding of Indigenous is and you know are are you bringing some of those biases to the table when when you see someone sitting in front of you who appears Indigenous or are you also open to someone like me walking into your office who identifies as Indigenous but I you wouldn't guess that from the look of me and by extension I may be afraid to disclose that to you um, because of some of the negative impacts that we still see today in terms mm. of disclosing our Indigenous heritage to a healthcare provider. So this is still an evolving thing. And I would really just encourage anyone who's a, especially the healthcare providers here, um, you know, just ask yourself those questions. Are you truly providing culturally appropriate care 
to your patients um, and, and giving every opportunity to do so. And if not, not to judge yourself, but then to ask yourself, what are some of the resources? What are some of the things I can start to look at to help me to become a more culturally aware, culturally sensitive uh, practitioner? And, oh, I and, so yeah. agree with you, you know, it, yeah. and I like within the WHO, the World Health Organization mandate, you know, they, I mean, they define that optimal health um, and well-being are inclusive of the physical, social, psychological, emotional um, and spiritual dimensions of life. And, and we're talking about their cultural needs. I mean, that's, but it's funny because I, I don't know, I mean, I did my midwifery training, you know, some time ago and New Zealand is renowned for um, you know, producing really high quality midwives. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there, there still wasn't a lot, you know, in the whole cultural thing. But then again, what we're talking about um, in my particular situation is a country that's very multicultural. So um, yeah, but what we're talking about here is more that focus on the indigenous um, residents and you know that the ones they've had to endure through the colonization um, you know and as you say that they've basically inherited PTSD hmm. um, but it's funny it's like we we talk about it a lot more than we learn about it hmm. sometimes yeah. yeah so this is why it's so good what you're doing and you know so often with the speakers that we have or well, nearly always um, the, the, the whole reason that they are focused on their particular specialty topic um, that they're passionate about is because of their journey, you know, and it's because, it, you know, you're part Mohawk, so that came through and um, it's fascinating, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. fascinating. So thank you so much for your time, Sarah. And um, I love that picture, particularly that you put up of the three generations, grandmother, mother, and yourself, um, you know, I think we we know that as midwives, but that is something that's really forgotten, you know, that um, all our eggs are formed in our body when we were in our mother's womb. And, um, you know, it, it's, well, it, yeah, it, it all just shows how that inheritance comes through, isn't it, you know? Mm. Anyway, that's just absolutely wonderful. So um, we will send a message out, of course, um, to, to for, for people to be able to connect with you. And I just want to thank you so much for, for you spending the time with us today, Sarah. Well, thank you so much for having me, Kathy. This has been wonderful. And I hope that it was uh, something that was helpful, at least in part, <laughs> for everyone who's able to attend. Absolutely. I think it's a topic that we need to always be talking about. So it's great, you know, let's have, and um, it's been a little while since we've had that topic on here. So it's good. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you to those attending live today. It's always wonderful. And um, I just want to wish everybody a wonderful rest of their week. So thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.